What's up, weirdos? Quick question for you. Can you feel Kennergy? Feel so real, my Kennergy. Okay, so I just got home from watching Barbie in theaters. Scratch that. I just got home from the tattoo shop, which I went to directly after seeing Barbie in theaters. I had to get a Kennergy tattoo. There was no option. That's not what this video is about. And it's also not about my sunburn, which is ironic because of the last video I made being about the importance of sunscreen. No, I want to talk about Barbie and Oppenheimer because I've seen them both and I am so sick and tired of- I see little bits of criticism anywhere and it just infuriates me. So let's just start off by getting right into Barbie because I've been seeing stuff like this ever since it came out, which is basically just- Ooh, feminists! Stupid! Feminists stupid! Look at this tweet. Or sorry, X? I, what the fuck is Elon Musk doing? Feminists, we don't need men. If that's the case, then why have I never seen any of y'all doing these jobs? The job in question being wrapping chains around a muddy metal pole? I, 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 this type of feminist stupid. Oh, if feminists so right, then how come girl no strong? If feminists are right, then how come more boys trucks and girls don't have trucks? Girls have bicycles with uh, little baskets on them because those are for girls and trucks are for boys. Which is crazy because if they had watched Barbie, they would know that that is literally the plot of Second Act Kendom. So first of all, I want to start out by talking about Ken because clearly he made a mark on me. Any critique of Barbie that comes from a place of, it says that boys are bad, it's so mean about boys. First of all, even if it was, sh shut up, it's a Barbie, shut up. But it actually was so not mean to boys. It had so much compassion and so much empathy for men. So when I came out of the theater and I'm seeing all of these like Ben Shapiro type MFs saying bullshit like, one of the Barbies is a trans Barbie, and this is treated totally normally, as though this is a female Barbie with a voice again deeper than my own. That's the little boy who thinks he's funny. The little boy who thinks he's so smart and funny. I didn't know that that Barbie was a trans woman. I thought that that was a woman because she is a woman because she's a woman. She looks beautiful and she looks like a woman because, and this is gonna blow your mind, she is a beautiful woman. I don't, I, oh, but she's transgender. Therefore, she shouldn't exist. Shut up. Anyways, him and anybody else who's kind of like in that camp was talking so much about how it's so political and it's so, politicized. First of all, if you actually watched the movie, you might understand what Greta Gerwig is trying to say about womanhood, and you might shed a tear, but instead he obviously goes in there trying to find little things that he can make his little quippy little TikToks about and miss the point because he's so dumb. Barbie is not a feminist movie in the way girls so cool, men so bad. And if you think that that's what it is, then your brain has been rotted. Your brain is literally oatmeal goo. The oatmeal that I was taking a bath in last night because of my sunburn. By the way, I did put on sunscreen. I just didn't know how long we were going to be out there, so I wasn't able to reapply it. So shut up. It's a very Ken thing to do anyways. And I am literally Ken. And Ken is not portrayed as an abject evil man. Objectively evil. Who cares? And real quick, I know like the big question that you probably are wondering is did I like Barbie or Oppenheimer better and I will tell you that at the end of the video I want to go through like how I felt watching both of these movies before I do that and first quick thing from Cooper before the sunburn hey quick question are you beautiful because beautiful people generally have tummy problems and this video has been brought to you by colon broom colon broom is a high fiber dietary supplement the main component is psyllium husk which if you know anything about your belly it, it, you know that that's a great ingredient to have to get your belly running right because it has scientifically been proven to help with intestinal problems help with constipation help with diarrhea because it, it cleans you out it cleans you out. You take one scoop out of this, mix it with a glass of water, drink the whole thing, and you'll start to see the benefits real quick. And it's great to foster like a healthy gut bacteria system. I'm actually just genuinely saying this because I really do like it and it's really good and it helps. Like your gut is a very important part of your body and a lot of people just don't put as much effort into that as they should. And once I started like actually taking care of my gut health, I noticed a marked improvement in like my health in every aspect. So really like genuinely you should care more about that and Colon Broom is a very great supplement for that. I say all that to say they're having their biggest sale right now where you can get six months worth of it for 65% off. And if you use code COOPER10, you get an additional 10% off. So click the link in my description below or in the pinned comment and use code COOPER10 to get your gut feeling right. And now back to the video. My understanding of what the movie Barbie was doing was, you know how when you're in therapy and they're like, hey, speak to the inner child. You have to heal your inner child. That's what the Barbie land kind of represents. And it's not just the inner child for the girls. It's not just Barbie's who are their inner children in Barbie land. It is also Ken's who are boys' inner child. They love things like beach, horses, backflips, surfing. And you know what? My inner child also loves those things. My inner boy loves those things. And I also think those things are cool. And the point of that isn't these interests are stupid and dumb and lame and men are stupid and dumb and lame. It's 
hey, you are Ken of. Because when Ken accompanies Barbie to the real world, he sees that it's actually been flipped on its head from what he's used to, and men are in charge. What a shocker. By the way, there's no other f***ing way that the Barbie movie could even exist. There's no other story that, like, Barbies, what they are, are highly accomplished women who are in charge and at the peak of existence. So that being their reality, and then they go to the real world and see that it's completely flipped on its head, and men and the patriarchy is in charge, and that's the thing. The second that the term patriarchy gets thrown around, all these Ben Shapiro type guys to clam up and get worried. And by the way, I'm gonna start talking about Oppenheimer in a little bit too, so don't worry. But it's almost as if the word patriarchy is just venom to a man's ears. Like, oh, we, we can't we, we, we can't think that exists. That, that can't be real. That means boys are bad. Newsflash, boys are generally bad. There's a scene where her and Ken are rollerblading on Santa Monica Beach and she's getting objectified and ogled and people are looking at her and she feels unsafe, self-conscious, and Ken feels like admired. I feel great. I feel everybody's looking at me, but with respect. And if you are to say that that is not reflective of the real experiences of men and women, then you're stupid. Men like Ben Shapiro are not smart because they talk fast like this. They're stupid because they have no sense of media comprehension. Hey, maybe this movie about womanhood that discusses and dismantles the idea of the patriarchy, maybe it has things to say that are negative about the patriarchy. Oh, that's crazy. And for men to come out here and be like, no, you can't do that. That's stupid. You shouldn't be allowed to do that. You cannot be the oppressor and say that the oppressed have to make art that makes you look good. The patriarchy subjugates women, and then a woman director has to make a movie that is about womanhood that also praises men. Do you know how stupid that sounds? Women are oppressed by men. LGBTQ+, women of color, more. That is what the movie is exploring. So you can't then say, oh yeah, the oppressor, the subjugator, the patriarchy, let's also put them in a good light. And what's insane is that it sounds like I'm describing it as a movie of women going on screen and saying, boys are so bad, girls are so cool, because that's what they're saying it is. And she does not do that at all. She simultaneously criticizes, parodies, and insults the system of the patriarchy, shows it for what it is, calls out its stupidities and its idiosyncrasies, Damn, I just used that word and just then flow. While at the same time having so much compassion and so much empathy for the men who are in the patriarchy. Do you realize how hard that is to balance? And she's still getting criticism? Okay, let's let's talk about this though. Act one, Ken, in love with Barbie, knows that his entire purpose is to love Barbie and beach. But Barbie constantly rejects his advances because but he never she just likes him a little bit, but you know, she's not in love with him, but he's in love with her. So there's this eternal battle where it's almost like incel, almost incel, but don't apply that. It's like a parody of like a inner child's version of what incel is, okay? I'm not saying act one Ken is an incel, but I'm saying that it has tie. Do you know what I'm, do you, are you with me? So then in act two, when he sees, oh wait, in the real world, I get treated like Barbie gets treated in Barbie land. And then he gets so excited and he, and, and he starts to, you know, see, see, see what his life could be like. A woman comes up and asks him for the time, and he's just absolutely flabbergasted. A woman asking him for anything? God, it, it's a good feeling. My God, it's a good feeling. He goes back to Barbie Land, and you've seen the movie. He recreates the patriarchy in Barbie Land. And it is such a masterfully well done thing by Greta Gerwig. And her husband, Noah Baumbach, also helped writing it, but he's just Ken. Let's give this to Greta. Let's not give it to Greta. Let's not use that language. Greta did this. I also just do like Noah Baumbach as a writer, so I just wanted to mention him. But the way that she handled that was phenomenal because it is the version of an inner boy like a, a young inner boy who wants to be something he wants to be loved and he finally realizes that he can have what he wants and then he goes home and then he, he gets what he wants and it's like for the inner child it's like oh so exciting but then you see what that is and you see that oh yes sure part of it is mojo dojo casa house which is what this crib is called <laughs> it's not just horses and trucks and backflips is then the subjugation of women. He's reflecting reality in Barbie land. And in Barbie land, he is now subjugating the women, okay? So reality, women are subjugated. Barbie land, now with Ken creating the patriarchy, women are subjugated. In what world is this a far-fetched thing that is a bad move for Greta Gerwig to make? Like in what world is that worthy of criticism? Especially because third act Ken, by the way, I have third act Kenergy. That's what I am. I'm not second act Kenergy. I'm third act Kenergy. Barbie comes back home. She sees what Ken has done. She sees how hurt he was by her rejecting him. And she feels a little bit of empathy, a little bit of compassion, a little bit of guilt. 
guilt. But first and foremost, she's got to get her girls together and take back Barbie Lane. And she does that in a hilarious way of saying, oh no, we're not just going to go beat up the boys. We're going to turn the boys against each other. And it's a great example of tearing down the patriarchy in a way that's like showing how stupid and how dumb the patriarchy is. She gets them to like play music on the guitar and sing into their eyes. And is making fun of that, by the way, which I am certain that every single man in the audience who has done that, who's sitting with his girlfriend that he played the music to, is just feeling like, ugh. Which is a good feeling for those men to have because I have never played a ukulele or a guitar in front of a woman and sang to her because I am self-aware. I'm third act Kennergy and I hate the people who play guitars. By the way, have stood on this since high school, since I saw the first dude whip out a guitar and start playing Wonderwall. It is corny, it is lame, it is cringe, it is disgusting. But it's, you know, it's fine. Like there was a viral TikTok one time where there was a guy playing his guitar on a beach to a woman, literally, and it had like 4 million likes. And all the comments were from dudes, oh dude, sick play, sick riz. And all the comments from the girls were like, I would be cringing and wanting to crawl within my skin and leave and die. So they show that, so they do that. And then they have, you know, the, the Kens all turn on each other. And then they have the fantastic climax of the Kens fighting each other while I'm just Ken plays. That song is my anthem. God, I've been Ken and Barbie hasn't loved me. God, that is so me. Third act Ken where he's like, crying because he doesn't know who he is without her? That's me. Or it was me. 2023 Cooper, evolved Ken Cooper. I know that I am Ken off. That's why I got this tattoo. Oh, it's gonna be on you forever. It's gonna be on you forever. That's why I got it because I will always be Ken off. I didn't want to get Ken off tattooed. I wanted to get Kennedy tattooed. Shut up. Anyways, I say all that to say the Barbie movie was incredible. And the fact that they're getting criticism from these Ben Shapiro types is absurd because they literally addressed it in the movie. There is a phenomenal speech by America Ferreira where uh, Margot Robbie doesn't have any makeup on. You know that scene. It's funny. Basically talking about how it is impossible to exist as a woman in the patriarchy. How you have to be nice, but you can't be too nice, but you have to always look good, but you can't look too good because then you'll be a slut and you can't be like how you have to be everything but you can't be more than a man because then a man will feel insecure. And then literally she creates a beautiful movie about womanhood that also hand in hand is so empathetic and compassionate to the men who operate within the system of the patriarchy and says, hey, you are Kenoff. You don't have to subjugate women. It is okay to just like horses and motorcycles. That is enough for you. There are multiple scenes in the movie that are devoted to basically showing Ken that he is enough without Barbie. That's a massive plot line in this movie. This dude tweeted right here, and I've seen him on Twitter a lot. I don't know if he's like famous Twitterer or Xer. It is genuinely insane that a key subplot in Barbie is that Mattel executives care more about feminism than profit. That's not true. Shut up. I've seen that so much. I'm sorry if you believe that or like that tweet. I'm not, I don't want to tell you to shut up. It's just not true. It's literally it literally the opposite point that they're making. And this is why it's so important to watch things without going into it with preconceived notions. Because I walked out of that theater thinking, I cannot believe that Mattel published this movie that went so hard on Mattel. It was so absolutely hard on them. Unforgivingly hard on them. They showcased the entire Mattel corporation as this cold corporate place with no love and nothing that is run by only men who have also in prison, I, I don't know, the ghost of the woman who created Barbie in this cold, dark hallway that they are mining for more, you know, Barbies and more private, you know, that's more subtextual. But literally, I was expecting the entire time to be like, Ugh, they're gonna have to have some bullshit thing where the Mattel executives end up being the good guys. But no, the end of the movie, they're like, maybe we could make a normal girl Barbie. And Will Ferrell, the like CEO of Mattel was like, no. And then somebody behind him goes, oh, research says that'll make a lot of money. And then he goes, yes. That is the ending of the Mattel executives character arcs. They are literally written as the patriarchy who uses feminism as a camouflage in order to get profit. They tried to imprison Barbie. They tried to imprison her. Sorry, I gotta put some aloe vera on real quick. There was no Mattel redemption. At every single turn, they were only reacting to an excitement about the money that they were making. But because Barbie is getting so much good press and everybody loves it so much, Max EPM 106 has to go online and say that it sucks because he has the, I have to feel different gene. Max feels like a he him, I don't know. Yeah, it is a he him. Of course it is, a 19 year old he him. Shut the f up, Max. Oh no, I don't like Barbie because it's pro-capitalism. Shut the f up, it's so obviously not. You just didn't like it because you probably played guitar to a girl and then she broke up with you, idiot. Now, quick rapid fire, uh, just additional things. So much funnier than I thought it was gonna be. Like, genuinely laugh out loud funny the entire time. It was absolutely hilarious. The funniest movie I've seen in years, funnier than outright comedies that I've seen all year. One of the funniest comedies I've seen, period. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm putting 10 toes down on that. 
I mean, the scene where Barbie comes back and says that she wants to, like, be Ken's low-maintenance, long-distance, casual girlfriend, and then he, like, walks away and he goes, SUPPLY! Hilarious. The scene where Margot Robbie is crying, talking about how she feels ugly, and then the narrator says, We understand that you shouldn't cast Margot Robbie if this is the point you're trying to get across. Hilarious. I mean, I can't even pick out ever- Because I- There wasn't a scene where I wasn't laughing, except for the ending. That ending montage about womanhood, and the scene where she's sitting on the bench, and then she looks at the elderly woman, and then she says- to the elderly woman, like, you're so beautiful. And sh you see that Barbie understands that you know, aging gracefully is good and beautiful. And then the elderly woman says, I know. And then she smiles. That was so beautiful. I'm tearing up a little bit. That was so beautiful. And seeing her early on in the movie have that understanding that, you know, it's okay to have a little bit of cellulite. It's okay to age. That was so beautiful. It's seriously in my top five favorite movies of all time. And I know the question that you're going to ask is, so which did you like better, Barbie or Oppenheimer? And I'm about to talk about Oppenheimer in a second. But I just want to say at this like midpoint that this has been the best year for movies that I've personally ever gone to the theaters for. I have seen more movies that have impacted me and like been massive moments for me this year than any other year in my life. Asteroid City, I would have said was my favorite movie of all time before this past weekend. But then I see Barbie and I see Oppenheimer. They both also go in my top five of all time. It's just been incredible and I'm so grateful that these movies are coming out. Anyways, Barbie was beautiful. Barbie was wonderful. Barbie was hilarious. Barbie was everything. And I am literally Ken. Now let's talk about Oppenheimer. So first of all, I just want to preface this with American Prometheus is my favorite book of all time. I read that sucker cover to cover and it's a behemoth, but I was so interested in the subject matter. And Christopher Nolan has said this so many times, it's not like an original thought for me to say this, but it is the most dramatic situation in human history. That's the way that I feel about it. The idea that there was a non-zero chance that hitting that button would destroy the entire world, and then they still hit that button. I don't know how you can do that. That's insane. And before I'd read American Prometheus, my thought had always been, it just, the nuclear bomb should have never been invented. It, absolutely immoral, absolutely horrible, should not have been invented ever. And then after reading American Prometheus, and you know, it reaffirmed in the movie Oppenheimer itself, there was never a chance where it's like, do we make it or do we not? Once that scientific discovery was made that you could, you know, fire and like split up atoms. Once that discovery was made that that was possible, a nuclear bomb was inevitable. It was just a matter of who would get it first. And it's terrible and it should have never happened. And it's like no nuclear bomb should ever exist. But once it could exist, of course you wouldn't want the Nazis to have it. Because it's, you know, the famous sign, I know what happens if the Nazis have it. And that's so echoed in the book, American Prometheus. It's such a massive like driving force in Oppenheimer's life that he was so naive as to think that this creation, that if he created this, it would lead to peace unlike the world has ever seen. Because once a bomb like this exists, then any war is unimaginable. That's what he naively thought. And then I see people online talking about how it is like immoral and you're a bad person if you watch Oppenheimer. That's the type of stuff that I see online about Oppenheimer. Not a lot, like granted, it's just as much as the bad stuff about Barbie because overwhelmingly people are massive fans of Barbie and massive fans of Oppenheimer, the movie, not the man. But when I went to see it, I saw it on opening night at the, the Chinese theater, 70 millimeter IMAX. Like I flew to LA to go see that because I'm such a huge American Prometheus fan and I knew Christopher Nolan had done something crazy here. And there were people protesting outside of it and it was wild, the protesters were communists. Which, if I'm being real, I kinda rock with the, the commies on a lot of things. But me knowing that like, a huge part of Oppenheimer's life is his ties with communism and how people were trying to call him a communist when he wasn't, he just ideologically agreed with them on certain things like labor rights and stuff. The good things about communism. But the optics of having communists outside protesting Oppenheimer in a movie where the communists or with Soviet Russia and Stalin and like Lenin. It was a very surreal experience because they can say these things of like, you shouldn't make a movie about this. But it's like, I'm about to step into a movie that the whole like thing is about his ties to the communist party and him getting expelled from the nuclear, like the atomic committee. Like it was very surreal. And the idea that the movie would glorify the nuking of Japan. People protesting it saying, I'm a communist. And also it glorifies that. It's like how Ben Shapiro, I clearly did not see or even try to watch Barbie in a way that was, you know, there was no objectivity in his viewing of Barbie. And I think that if you watched Oppenheimer. I do not understand how you can walk out of the theater thinking that one, he's a good man, and two, it's cool that we nuked Japan. That was so 
so antithetical to the point of the movie. And then there's the criticism from, there's a, like a lot of dudes who are like, oh, the bomb wasn't cool enough. I wanted more of the, the bomb. If there was more of the bomb, like these dudes are wanting, then that would definitely be seen as more glorifying. I think that it was, actually, I don't even think, I know, because I have media comprehension that the Trinity test and the explosion of the bomb was not the climax of the movie. The climax of the movie is after that, when he is in that auditorium with the people stamping their feet, cheering his name, and he is haunted by what he has just done, what he has just created, and what it means. My favorite scene in any movie ever is that scene. It is the most haunting, the most horrifying, chilling, impactful thing that I have ever seen. If that felt to you like glorification of it, then I don't know what movie you were watching. The entire point, especially the ending scene when it's like, when he's talking to Einstein and you hear the conversation that Strauss had like seen from a distance and thought it was about him and Oppenheimer is actually talking about, hey, remember that conversation that we had where we were worried that the nuclear bomb would set off a chain reaction that would end the world? And then Einstein says, yes, I remember this. What happened? And Oppenheimer, with the final line of the movie, says, I believe we did. And then it cuts to that montage that basically leaves you realizing the end of the world's mutually assured destruction by nuclear bombs, you know, everybody exploding each other is almost like it's gonna happen. And you are left with that. You are left with that of the creation of the nuclear bomb means that the world will end by nuclear annihilation. And him seeing that future, especially with where we are today, before the movie was written, before they were even filming it, Russia had not invaded Ukraine. But living in a post-Russia invading Ukraine world, post-Putin explicitly not taking nuclear bombs off of the playing table, watching the movie, seeing that, after realizing what the nuclear bomb is capable of, I feel like that movie should be shown to every single living leader who has any sort of power and everybody who ever will have any sort of power and people in Silicon Valley who are f making massive decisions about AI. That very much ties in with the message of Oppenheimer. And it was a deeply impactful, deeply haunting movie that its message sticks with you more than any movie that I have ever seen. Not in a way of, oh, this story really stuck with me, but in a way of, I feel different and I feel affected by that. And then to go online and see, you know, small pockets of people basically saying that it glorifies Oppenheimer and his life. No, Oppenheimer died at the height of the conflict between the US and Russia, literally believing that he had set in motion events that would lead to the imminent destruction of humanity. That's what that final scene is. I mean, it's so much more impactful now because of the world that we're living in in these years. But on a personal, biographical level, that is saying that Oppenheimer could not feel more haunted by what he had done. And if you've read American Prometheus, you know he very explicitly was careful with how he discussed his role in the creation of the atomic bomb. He never said outright that he regretted it. He never said that he wished he hadn't done it. My interpretation is because he so explicitly uh, had characterized why he did it in the first place, because he thought naively that it would be able to create peace that the world had never seen, and that he would have that power, and other people who were creating the bombs might not have that same good heart that he has, but then he creates it and now he's kicked off the atomic energy. Like he doesn't have any power over it. He is a intensely, deeply complicated man. And the movie is about that because he's one of the most important people in history. And it is about the most dramatic moment in history and the fallout that is still affecting us today and will forever. We live in the shadow of Oppenheimer's creation. That is true. And then you see criticism online that's like, this movie shouldn't exist because he stole land from people in New Mexico. And the movie didn't spend enough time dedicated to that. It's like, do you think that the movie makes the military industrial complex look good? Do you think it makes Oppenheimer look good and the creation of the nuclear bomb look good? It's also those scenes that are outside of Strauss's perspective. By the way, he didn't meet Strauss until well after the creation of the atomic bomb. So everything that we're seeing before that, like it, the, the scenes in color are from Oppenheimer's subjective view, which I mean, it's not me saying that, everybody knows that. But Christopher Nolan writing the script in first person, like I walk here, I do this being Oppenheimer. You don't step outside of his experience. That's not how that works. This movie was created to show the haunt and the torment of that creation and how awful it was by taking us into the mind of the deeply complicated man who created it and showing what effect that terrible creation had on his psyche. He is never happy for the rest of his life. And in order to get that feeling across, to create the movie in this way, and the way that it was successful with sticking with everybody, with giving that haunting final scene that will never leave anybody who's ever seen that movie. In order to do that, you write the movie from his subjective experience, meaning that you don't then add on an additional runtime and take away from his subjective experience to see, oh, some of his students didn't like him and they're having interpersonal conversations between them. Oh, the people who lived in New Mexico were affected by this. Because the point of the movie isn't about how Oppenheimer and the military industrial complex created this massive city in Los Alamos. 
and it deeply impacted people who lived there before. That's not what the movie, if there was a movie about that, then sure, and people can write a movie about that. But it would be a very disconnected departure and it would feel like you're patronizing the audience to be like, basically people who criticize Oppenheimer saying that it, you know, glorified a bad man and made a bad man look good and made a nuclear bomb look good and made all his actions look good. I think that they just saw the poster where he's standing in front of a nuclear bomb, which, you know, which there's an argument to be made for, hey, that's a suspect poster for uh, the creator of the nuclear bomb. Bomb. Looks a little bit marvel-y for that. I've heard people say that and I can totally see where they're coming from. When I look at it, he does not look like a protagonist. He looks like a like a horror man. Very scary horror, horror boy. Not a hero. If you watch the movie, there's just no way you can think it paints him in a good light. It shows you what his experience is and you have empathy. Empathy in the way of like understanding him deeply. I just don't think that it's then fair to say, okay, if you watch this movie, then you're a bad person because I personally think that it glorifies him. It doesn't, it doesn't. And I don't like the movie because it glorifies him. Because it does it. So that's my thoughts on Barbie and I. Okay, and not to mention, after saying all of that, I feel like I just have to close by saying the incredible scenes in Oppenheimer. That scene at the beginning of the movie of him learning quantum physics at Cambridge while also battling schizophrenia. One of the most beautiful and haunting things I've ever seen. The score of Oppenheimer is my favorite score in any movie ever. Listen to that, the, the, the track. I think it's Can You Hear the Music. It's that Cambridge scene where those visuals are flying around and he's like throwing glass at the corner. It is unbelievably beautiful. And to see that contrasted with the ending scene of the movie with a similar montage with a similar score, but instead of showing him learning quantum theory, it's showing him seeing the future, which is the ending of the world by mutually assured nuclear destruction. Killian Murphy gave the best performance I've ever seen in any movie, ever. That performance, it's generational. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. I think that Christopher Nolan did exactly what he was trying to do, and he did what he set out to accomplish, perfectly. Every aspect of that movie is some of the best that I've ever seen in any movie. The visuals, seeing that in IMAX, unreal. It was his best writing by far. Sound mixing, you could actually hear the dialogue in this one, so that was nice. And the message of it was clearly communicated in a way that I've never seen him do before in my entire life. And this movie is, okay, we're getting to the point where I'm going to say what my favorite movie is. For me, personally, for me, my tastes, what I look for in a movie, Oppenheimer is my favorite movie of all time. It's my number one movie of all time. So with that being said, it has to be, you know, above Barbie in my personal tastes. And I would just say, I would not be shocked and I would not be surprised if Barbie is a lot more people's favorite movie of all time. But I'm sure that there may be people who've even commented this before they've even gotten to this part of the video. There's just a huge part of Barbie where it's not made for me. I understand it, I totally get it. Really like, okay, Ken's arc, I totally get that. It has like healing the inner boy, but that's B plot. You know, that's really like subplot. And the main plot is Barbie coming to accept herself, coming to love herself, coming to understand and love what it means to be a woman, a woman who is human. <laughs> yeah, it's a movie about womanhood and it was beautiful and it was hilarious. It was well-written, it was flawless. I loved it and it was absolutely not pro-capitalist. Anybody who says that is stupid. But I think that, yeah, it would be very pick me for me to say that Barbie was my favorite movie of all time because it just can't impact me the same way that it can its target audience. And I don't, like, what? What, is that a bad thing about it? No. But it would be pick me if I was like, oh yeah, I really connected to what it means to be a woman. Now, that not to say I didn't understand it. I understood, I under totally understood it. I was so locked in, so locked in with the message. <sighs> Damn. But even though it's about something that doesn't personally hit me as hard as it does its target audience, it's still in my top five. Genuinely, I might've seen my number one and number two movies of all time this weekend. I don't know, because Pirates of the Caribbean was my number two, but Johnny Depp. I guess Barbie's my second favorite movie of all time. That's crazy. This has been the best year, the best weekend of my entire life. For movies and i want to know what you think about each of the movies individually because it's weird i feel like the entire time i was talking about oppenheimer i was like trying to defend it from the criticism i believe that the movie is worthy of defending not j robert oppenheimer the creator of the nuclear bomb who chose the targets in japan like he is not worthy of defending yes he made those decisions knowing that basically what he was doing was kind of turning himself into an evil character and he still consciously went forwards and did that i think j robert oppenheimer as one of the most impactful and complicated men in human history good intentions mean nothing when you are nuking Japan. And I know it's like complicated because once that discovery was made, there was going to be a nuclear bomb. It was inevitable. All that mattered was who got it first. And it's very good that the Stalin led Russians didn't get it first. And it is very good that the Germans didn't get the nuclear bomb first. And yes, you can have the idea that it will end all wars. That's a very naive thought. And at the end of the day, yes, you won. 
Yes, you created it first. Yes, you're a hero for a second. You are now responsible for the worst thing that has ever been made. He's not worthy of defending. But the movie, I think if you watch it, is not making the case of J. Robert Oppenheimer is a flawless great man worthy of praise. I think that it is a movie that displays the most dramatic moment in human history, one of the most important men in human history, I say men because Barbie's more important than him, and asks of the audience deeply impactful questions and leaves those questions in that haunting feeling. I think that's what the movie is. It's not a J. Robert Oppenheimer, aka my boy. No, although it's my favorite movie of all time, I didn't get an Oppenheimer tattoo. I got a Kennergy tattoo. I love y'all very much. Please subscribe. Okay, you know what? No, the video is not over yet. I just got back home after I was filming that video. I was like, I gotta watch it again. So I went and did it my second uh, Barbie Oppenheimer, my Barbenheimer double feature. It's two in the morning right now and I have thoughts. The thing that I was getting tripped up with trying to explain my feelings on Oppenheimer and how people are hypercritical about it in a way that like feels like they're lacking media literacy of the thing that they're critiquing. In doing that, I brought up the whole situation of the New Mexican land being co-opted by the military industrial complex. And I was basically saying that like, you can't expect a movie that is literally from Oppenheimer's perspective. And the whole thesis of the movie is that it is within his own subjective like perception of reality. You can't ask that to then discuss the ethical ramifications of every single action he's taken from the perspective of the people whose actions he's harmed. Because that is antithetical to the message of anti-war that Christopher Nolan has created this movie for. This movie is an anti-war film, not a film about all of these other things. And discussing all of those other things while completely valid in their own right and valid critiques of the historical character of Oppenheimer and Strauss, like that whole situation, those critiques are extremely valid. But because the character Oppenheimer is in this movie, we then want to levy those same critiques to him in the movie. But the thing is, he is created as a character to tell this story. It's not a documentary about everything that he's ever done. And discussing the ethical ramifications of every action he's ever taken detracts from what the movie is doing with that character, which is a deeply unsettling and haunting message about anti-war and the tragedy of the life of a man. And by the way, not a tragedy in a way of, oh, he's good. The tragedy of Macbeth. Macbeth isn't a great guy, okay? So I hope that clears things up on Oppenheimer. And then as watching Barbie, it just hit me so hard. Michael Sarah is a God. I cannot believe I didn't talk more about Alan in the previous part of this video. Alan is legitimately popping on every single shot that he's in. He's incredible. Ryan Gosling gives an utterly grounded in the reality of the character of Ken. His performance is perfection. And Margot Robbie, the work that she does with Barbie when she's giving the speech as she's crying and before America Ferreira gives her speech about, you know, how difficult it is to be a woman, which deprograms the other Barbie. Before she gives that speech, Margot Robbie is sitting on the ground crying and it has that funny moment where Helen Mirren is like, note to the filmmakers, don't cast Margot Robbie if this is the point you're trying to get across. But the speech that Margot Robbie gives is so painful and like vulnerable and you see it in her performance. She is an incredible actress and she, as much as people want to say that Ken stole the show, and I love Ken, Margot Robbie is Barbie. She is Barbie, and she is the movie Barbie, and Greta Gerwig is one of my favorite directors of all time. Lady Bird, a 10 out of 10. I think a lot of people give the credit that it deserves, but Little Women, another 10 out of 10 that somehow is underrated in like society at large, but the people who have seen it know how incredible it is, and her hand as a director is so visible in all of these movies, showing her creative influence in a masterful way, and, and what she did with Barbie could not have been done by any other director, and I stand 10 toes down on that. It is a sensation, it is an iconic film because of Greta Gerwig, and because of Mar Robbie, and because Ryan Gosling went back to his Disney Channel roots and brought that energy. I love y'all weirdos so much. I hope that that cleared anything up. Please subscribe. I watched those movies, and all that I could think of in the back of my mind was like, oh shit, I, I missed out on talking about these things. I, I should, I should, I should have said these things. Like I should have, I should have also talked about this. And I felt, you know, like I had to come back here and and, and finish the video. I, I felt like job's not finished, you know. Also, I figured out that this is gonna cover my sunburn, so I will just wear this until it's healed. And I have been sitting in the theater for basically six hours. I have to pee.